So um, here we are at this particular meeting. I'll just tell you about the next particular meeting, which is going to be on the 20th of March. So uh, pop that one in your, your diaries. It would be lovely to see you then. And on that meeting, we have another three excellent speakers. We have Kira Thompson, um, who's going to be sort of lullaby-ish. It's uh, on that sort of subject. Um, then there's Ridian Griffiths, um, who's a Welshman and his uh, theme is towards Wales. And then Alison McFarlane, um, and uh, I've got to, um, mm, 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 mm. well, her talk is entitled, Who Was Mrs Joyner of Chiswell Green? And if you want to find out, then come along yeah. on the 20th of March. And the other bit of news that Martin wanted to say is that there's a, a newsletter coming up um, from TSF to you. So if you've got any news, um, please do let him know, because uh, obviously newsletters, that's what they contain. And um, if you've got any news at all that you'd like other people to know about, then, then please send it to him. And then, of course, it's another Vaughan Williams Memorial Library lecture coming up. And that's on the 16th of March. And this time it's from Joan Passy, who's talking about folk song collection in Cornwall. So if you would like to book on that and listen to her talk, you go to vwml.org and you can get your ticket there. So we're going to launch off with our three speakers this afternoon. We have Brian Peters and then Katie Housen and then Meg Highland. So we're going to start with Brian, and uh, we've already enjoyed one of our, Brian's talks about the uh, music in the Appalachians. So uh, uh, another one coming up. So over to you, Brian. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to remember to share my sound. <laughs> uh, oh, bugger, oops, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> I remember to share my sound, but I forgot to um, actually select the PowerPoint. There we go. <laughs> right, ready to go. When that little thing, annoying little banner goes from the top. Right, here we go. Today I'm going to say something about the two trips that the English folk song collector Maud Carpley's made to the Appalachian Mountains of the USA in 1950 and 1955. Carpley's had accompanied Cecil Sharp on his three trips into the mountains in 1916, 17 and 18, having been employed originally as his amanuensis, though her role in those expeditions, in terms of planning, administration and simply keeping an ailing Sharp going, was far more significant than mere transcription. It had been impractical to transport recording equipment by mule back on those early trips, so Carpley's decided, 26 years after her mentor's death, to retrace their steps, armed with a tape machine. To this end, she enlisted the help of Sidney Robertson Cowell of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., an experienced folk song collector in her own right. In an excellent talk last autumn, Catherine Hebert Kirst gave an account of the 1950 trip, primarily from the point of view of Sidney Roberts and Cowell, and played several of the recordings the two women made. Although Cathy drew on both women's diaries, she did not have access to various other documents, notably Maud's correspondence with the Reverend Frank Etherington, an old friend of Cecil Sharp, whom she had got to know well. She provided in her letters to him much detail and some colourful personal opinions, absent from her diaries. Maud's visit to the USA lasted four months. Having arrived on RMS Queen Mary on July the 6th, 1950, she spent some time in New York with Esther and Meredith Langstaff before heading for the University of Indiana and the Conference of the International Folk Music Council. Maud was driven there by Evelyn Wells, an old friend she'd first met in Kentucky in 1917 when travelling with Sharp and who was to be her companion on the second Appalachian trip. The pair remained in Bloomington for the consecutively scheduled Mid-Century International Folklore Conference before returning to the East Coast, where Maud visited Nantucket, meeting Sharp's Appalachian enabler Olive Dame Campbell, and spending a week at what is now Pinewood's camp, where she was most impressed by the contribution of one Jean Ritchie. 
From New England, she travelled to Washington, D.C., where she was put up by Charles and Ruth Crawford Seeger, who accepted her almost as one of the family, though Moore detected in them significant ideological differences from her own views regarding folk song. She was favourably impressed by their son Pete, who, despite having adopted a popular style, did, at least, use folk music as a starting point and was artistically of great interest. Maud had arranged to spend some time during her visit to Washington working at the Library of Congress, where she was welcomed by the head of the Archive of Folk Song, Duncan Emery. However, the recorded material there disappointed her. Most of the records are poor from a technical point of view, and they are terribly mixed, with a very large proportion of popular songs which have no claim to be regarded as folk. And many of the folk songs are quite spoiled by the horrible guitar and banjo accompaniments. But it is all very interesting. She also met Burl Ives, whom she de described as a curious creature. I think he's a real artist and has a sense of values, but he is terribly gross looking, a sort of false stuff. Maud set off from Washington for the Appalachians with Sidney Robertson Cowell on September the 8th, 1950. Sidney's car was piled high with machines, notably the tape recorder belonging to the Library of Congress. They called first in Charlottesville, where Professor Arthur Kyle Davis played them recordings of traditional singers that he'd made. They spent the next few days tracking down some of the people Maud had met with Cecil Sharp over 30 years before. The opportunity to cover distances far more quickly and to record songs without laborious hand transcription were obviously beneficial, but the results were uneven. Doll Small in Nellisford, Virginia was hale and hearty and pleased to see me again, and a delightful afternoon was spent recording songs from Florence Puckett, formerly Fitzgerald. Kathy Kirst's talk included recordings from both singers. Many of Maud's other friends in the area, however, were dead and she remarked that they found not one outstanding singer. At the same time, the relationship with Sydney, though cordial, was obviously not made in heaven. How I wish I had Evelyn Wells as my companion. What fun we would be having. Mrs Cowell and I are hitting it off very well, so far, and I hope we will continue not to irritate one another. She is very bouncy and talkative, with a harsh voice, rather cocksure and little sense of humour, but she is very considerate and good-humoured and has a real appreciation of the people and their songs. Thank goodness she appreciates the older tradition. I can honestly say I think I am fortunate in having as good a companion. A singer new to Maud was Victoria Morris, to whom the two women had been directed by Arthur Kyle Davis. She was, according to Maud, a reserved, rather doer person, but quite ready to sing the kind of songs that were required, and told the English woman, it is right that you should take them back where they belong. Miss Morris's singing, Maud noted, was not exactly pleasing, but interesting because of the pronounced glottal stop. Listening to Maud's Appalachian recordings in their entirety, it's striking that Victoria Morris is the only singer to exhibit the kind of decoration that many people regard as the true mountain style, with the feathering at the ends of phrases. All the others sang very plainly. He mount her on a milk white stand, he himself upon the dipole grey. He drew his buckler down by his side, and we went a sing in the way. Wake up, wake up, my seven sons bow, and put on your armor so bright. I will never have it said that an order of mine shall stay with the Lord all night. Returning to Charlottesville, Maud and Sydney visited John Powell, former organiser of Virginia's renowned White Top Folk Festival, a great enthusiast for English music and a fan of Cecil Sharp, although they'd never met. Powell was also, according to the authoritative historian David Wisnant, a thoroughgoing racist, whose Anglo-Saxon club in Richmond had promoted a law forbidding cross-racial marriage in the district. Charles Seeger described White Top Festival, which allowed no black musicians to attend, as reactionary to the core, Maud, however, was very taken by Powell's eccentric attempts to present as an English gentleman and his piano renditions of Morris dance tunes. 
It may have been Powell's suggestion that Maud and Sidney visited a former white top singing competition winner, Horton Barker. Despite Sidney's testimony that Maud had initially been reluctant to collect from him after hearing Kyle Davis's recordings, Maud was surprised to find Barker a marvellous singer, better than his records would lead one to expect. Young women, they'll run like hares on the mountain. Young women, they'll run like hares on the mountain. If I were but a young man, I'd go and run after to my right fall a diddle dee row, to my right fall a diddle dee. I'm sure that song will be familiar to many of us here in England. This is not because migrants to Appalachia had carried it across the ocean and preserved it unaltered for centuries, but because Horton Barker, encouraged by the White Top Festival establishment, had learned it from Cecil Sharp's Book of Somerset Folk Songs. Such was John Powell's obsession with Anglo-Saxonism. By this time, the re relationship between Maud and Sydney had become a little more strained. We have been held up by the wretched car which has gone wrong, and not for the first time. The number of hours that I am held up by my companion, or her car, would be quite considerable were it all totted up. I have never known her to be ready at the time we arrange. She always has a letter to finish, or else has to stroke a cat, or admire a rare spider. She's not an ideal collecting companion, as she never stops talking, and I find it very exhausting. However, one mustn't look a gift horse in the mouth. It might very easily be worse. Proceeding into North Carolina, following further setbacks over former singers now dead, disappeared, or willing to give out only religious songs, Maud managed to locate an old acquaintance who was especially happy to see her. When I was feeling really despondent and almost ready to throw in my hand, I found Emma. This was Emma Hensley, now Shelton with whose family Sharp and Carpleys had become close friends back in 1916, providing financial assistance for Emma, then aged 13, to attend a local school from which she subsequently absconded. Emma still has the same quiet dignity and queenly bearing, combined with gaiety and a warm affection. We just fell into each other's arms and hugged each other. Mr Sharp had given her parents the Appalachian songbook, but her father had lent it to someone at Spilcorn, and it had been partly destroyed. She just loves the songs, she remembers the tunes, she doesn't remember the words very well, so I left the book for her so that she could study them up. She has strained her voice through yodelling, and it is not particularly good, but she sings musically. Emma instructed Maud to take my voice and my love back to England. We'll hear a sample of that voice a little later. With Sydney having departed briefly for Tennessee, Moore took a trip to Hot Springs, the mountain resort where Sharp had found his most prolific mountain singer, the famous Jane Gentry, in 1916. Jane had died, but Carpelly's recorded several songs from her daughter Maud Long before tracking down one of Sharp's surviving singers, Lizzie Roberts, in the same town. Sharp had notated Black is the Colour from Lizzie's singing, and had sung it himself a year later at Pine Mountain School, Kentucky, where it was picked up by two young members of the Ritchie family. They had brought it home, where it was learned by their sister Jean, and through her performances came to be a standard in the folk revival, often believed to be Irish. Thanks to Moore's recording, we can now hear the original. But black is the colour of my true love's hair His face is like some rosy fur The prettiest face and the neatest hand I love the ground where on you stand I love my love and well he knows I love the ground where on he goes if you know more on the I see I can't serve you as you have me even more fortunately, Maud made a second recording of the same song, which she described as a curiosity. Mrs Roberts, she wrote, has taught herself the harmonium and is very proud of it. She plays by ear. I'm 
sure you'll agree that the accompaniment greatly enhances the modal melody. Maud and Sidney carried on for another week seeking out and recording singers. One survivor of the Sharp expeditions was Linny Landers, then aged 20. By 1950, she was living in Jonesboro, Tennessee with her sister. Linny provided several songs for the tape recordings, including this lonesome version of the ballad known as Young Hunting or in Appalachia, Loving Henry. Coming, coming, my old true love, and stay all night with me, for I have a bed and a very fine bed, I'll give it up to thee, thee. I'll give it up to thee. I A search for Mary Sands, another of Sharp's finest singers, turned up only a rumour that she had lost her mind and walked the road singing. Two of her daughters were tracked down, but they had not inherited her talents. Moore wrote to Etherington, I went on to the end, finding and recording material, but there were many disappointments, and one has to realise that the tradition is fast disappearing. It's hugely ironic that within a dozen miles of Emma Shelton's home, the community of Revere, also known as Sodom Laurel, was the home of a number of subsequently famous traditional singers, including Doug and Basilla Wallen, Deli Norton and Dillard Chandler, all of whom were related to the very same Mary Sands. Somehow, the two collectors missed them. Cathy Kirst's talk highlighted the ideological differences between Maud Carpolis and Sidney Robertson Cowell. Where Sidney's boundaries were broad, Maud proudly declared herself a purist and was unwilling to accept that songs learned from the radio could be considered folk. At the Folklore Conference, she had been horrified that a song like The Little Rosewood Casket, a Vernon Dal Dalhart recording from 1924, popular with mountain singers, could be classified as a folk song by a university professor because it has been slightly altered by the man who heard it on the radio. Well, Maud wrote to Etherington that the main opposition to her views had come from one man, a certain Alan Lomax, who has done a lot of collecting and who has been generally active in popularising the songs. He's a nice man and intelligent, but adolescent and spoiled and very left. Of course, I'm here up against the same things that are happening in England. Perhaps it is old age that presents me from keeping up with the times. Maud returned to the mountains once more in 1955, and this time was able to travel with her companion of choice, her close friend Evelyn Wells, who had in the meantime acquired a tape recorder of her own. There is less to say about this trip, partly because Maud wrote no confessional letters home, and partly because singers had grown even harder to find. Maud and Evelyn returned to several of the people visited five years previously, finding Florence Puckett still able and willing to sing, but Doll Small considerably frailer than before, and Mrs Oscar Allen failed in mind. Evelyn was closer to Maud's view on what made a folk song. Both women dismissed songs with guitar accompaniment offered by two sisters in Afton as terrible hillbilly stuff. One good find was Layla Jowell, or Yowell, daughter of Napoleon Bonaparte Chisholm, from whom Sharp and Carpolis had taken a dozen or so songs in 1916. Maud, judgmental as ever, thought her singing uninteresting and very feeble. I rather like it. There was an old man lived under the hill, sang Tyro rattling day. If he ain't moved away, he's living there still, sang Tyro rattling day. This old man came up to his plow, sang Tyro rattling day. To see the old devil fly over his mare, sang Tyro rattling day. Once again, Maud headed to the home of Emma Hensley Shelton, voicing disapproval even of her old friend. The Sheltons have evidently made but little attempt to better themselves. Their log house is clean but very poorly furnished. 
as well as singing several songs previously unrecorded, Emma reminiscent for the, reminisced for the tape about Sharp and Carpley's original visit. When I was a little girl, uh, we had uh, some visitors from London, England, uh, Mr. Sharp and uh, Miss Maud Carpelees. And uh, they came to these mountains collecting the, the old folk songs, the, what we call the love songs, the old ballads. Some, some people and most people call them ballads instead of ballads. And uh, we sang lots of songs for them. My mother sang, and she had a beautiful voice. She could sing very beautifully. And Dad played the fiddle. Oh, he was a fiddler. I'm telling you he was a fiddler. And I remember that I sang some of the songs for them. I was a very small girl at that time. And uh, I, I was 13 at that time, but I won't give the date because that would give my age. <laughs> we just had a wonderful time. Emma promised to assist in tracking down further singers although Maud recorded that despite her optimism, Emma was slightly downcast when all her swans turned out to be geese. Her sister Ella was prevailed on to offer Dear Companion and, duetting with Emma, The Banks of Cloddy, but some of the most interesting music came from three further members of the Shelton clan that dominated the district, Domino, Dale and Roy, who had formed a string band. Domino played banjo in what he told Maud was The New Way, from her description clearly three-finger bluegrass style, while Dale, an excellent fiddle player, was likewise obviously influenced by bluegrass. Delighting the band by dubbing, dubbing them the Sugarloaf Sheltons after a local mountain, Maud and Evelyn recorded several instrumentals. The guitar was apparently too prominent on fire in the mountains and Cotton Eye Joe was deemed not a good tune, but Bonaparte's retreat received Maud's accolade. Very good. I love that rendition, but I can recognise that it is quite unlike other versions of the same tune heard in field recordings from the mountains. The third part, sometimes known as Little Egypt, was added on a 1949 commercial recording by country music star Pee Wee King, who sang a lyric set to the Bonaparte tune, backed by a band with twin fiddles and pedal steel guitar. A comparison leaves little doubt that the Sugarloaf Shelton's version was, unbeknownst to Maud, probably learn from the radio. Otherwise it was the same old story. Death, infirmity and religion had culled Maud's likely singers. One such was Sudie Sloan in Kentucky. Sudie Sloan, who with her sisters and her mother Mrs Broughton sang so well and eagerly before, would not utter a sound. She had given up singing because she had been saved. The collecting trip lasted three weeks, and Maud was somewhat downhearted, although the recordings that she and both her different companions made during the two trips are of great and lasting value. I'm going to leave you with the voice of Emma Shelton, the voice that Emma wished to be taken back to England with her love, singing The True Lover's Farewell. Fans of Nick Jones over here may recognise it. Nick found the song he called 10,000 Miles in Cecil Sharp's Appalachian collection, notated from the unison singing of Emma and her mother. Oh, fare you well, my own true love, so fare you well for a while. I'm going away, but I'm coming back if I go 10,000 miles. If I prove false to you, my love, the earth may melt and burn, the sea may freeze and the earth may burn, if I no more return. And on that musical note, I will leave you. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Thank you very much, Brian. That's excellent.
Fascinating. Gosh, quite an immersive experience as well, with uh, lovely pictures, gorgeous sound, and um, and yourself practically being Maud Carpley's voice. <laughs> <laughs> I never actually met her, but I can kind of guess. You know? <laughs> no, it was great. Really, really wonderful. Um, so we have time for questions since Brian's been so good about his uh, his timekeeping. So apart from I look, I can see lots of comments in the, in the chat already saying what a what a splendid presentation it, it was. Are there any questions in particular for, for anyone? I, I just like to say thank you so much, Brian. This was this was so wonderful. And okay. it was, as I wrote in the chat, it was exactly the reason why I wanted to present what I did in, um, in September, because I didn't have the full picture and I look forward to talking to you and learning more, but this was fascinating and amusing and uh, really wonderful. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Um, Brian, how, how did she fund her trip? Uh, now that is a really good question. And I don't think we've yet found an answer to that. I've, I've, talk, I've talked to Derek about this as well. I think Maud had some, some independent means of her own, but I, I don't think she was loaded, as it were. I know on the trip with, with Evelyn Wells, in Evelyn Wells's uh, journal, there are little notes of the mileage they were covering as, it, as though, you know, they might be looking for somebody to, um, you know, to cover their expenses. But I honestly don't know that. And I, I would really like to know it. it's, whether, you know, again, whether there were any, any kind of grants available to for the two conferences that she went to indiana one was the international folk folk music council which was kind of maud's baby anyway but then there was the international folklore conference the the bicentennial one or whatever mid-century but again you know who who would have come up with a grant for that i really don't know yeah, no i mean it would have would have been an expensive enterprise wouldn't it hmm. all told but yeah yeah traveling on the queen mary you know oh, absolutely hmm. yes not steerage i'm sure <laughs> Can I ask a question? Of course you may, darling, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Brian, that was that was lovely. Wonderful recordings. Where can we hear those? Well, a number of those are on a, a recording that came out on the Musical Traditions uh, label that was a, put together by, by Mike Yates, which is called When Cecil Left the Mountains. And it's uh, not they're not all Moore's recordings. Some of them are. Some of them are recordings from elsewhere. But the idea is to present a, a sort of snapshot of, of what happened to the music after Cecil had, had finished and gone. Um, though I also got a, a, one or two of them that are not part of that collection um, from some CDs that were part of Peter Kennedy's folk track series. Peter Kennedy managed to get hold of his own um, set of copies of the tapes. So I think the um, the, the recording of um, Lizzie Roberts with and without the harmonium were, were from those uh, folk tracks recordings that were released on CD by Camsco Music a few years back. I mean, the, the, there are still more recordings that I've never heard and the, the Vaughan Williams um, doesn't have them. I think there, there, there are some at the, uh, the BBC um, but not the full set. The Library of Congress will will have the full set, and one day I hope to listen to some of the other ones. Thank you. Right, we have oh, one. Oh, now we've got two questions. Of course, can we make them brief, and we'll fit in both Conrad and Margaret's questions. Thank you, Conrad. If you'd like to go. Hello? Is Conrad around? We can't hear you yet, Conrad. He needs to unmute. I was doing that. I had the thing kept going out, that bar keeps going up and down. So uh, it's very good to see the political or hear the political uh, uh, conclusions. I wasn't aware that she was made those sort of comments. Is there a biography that, that's comprehensive on her yet? No. There is not. Um, there, there is a, a biography that um, came out, and I can't remember the name of the author, but came out a few years ago called Singing and Dancing Wherever She Goes, but that doesn't mm -hmm. have an awful lot of information about, particularly about the Appalachian trips. There is also Maud's 
unpublished autobiography, which I studied in the Vaughan Williams Library. But again, there's not an awful lot of detail, detail in there that the priceless, she made, a, a, it kept a diary. She right. also had another little notebook, which she called Notes on the Singers, but the, the letters to Frank Etherington were where a lot of the juicy stuff came from. Well, that's, it's interesting to see that she made political assession, uh, assessments. Uh, Lomax, for example, you mentioned that he was he was left, and I thought, oh yes, I, was, I said I know he's left, but it's always good to have somebody contemporary said in that time he was left already. Yes, so that's a, a nice observation that you brought into this. Very nice talk. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I got the impression that particularly the second conference, the, uh, the the folklore conference, it was like Maud against the world. You know, she's she seemed to be holding to, holding on to this notion of authenticity in the face of certainly most of the American contributors had had really like like Sidney Roberts and Carl a much broader concept. Thank you, Conrad. Margaret, a, a quick one from you. But time is, Brian, that was superb. And you say you didn't meet her, but you did a superb job of being Maud. I actually did meet her. As a graduate student, uh, Herbert Halpert uh, nominated her for an honorary doctorate at Memorial University of Newfoundland. So she returned there after all those years collecting in Newfoundland. And one of the graduate students, Car and she's written something about this and it's published, Carol Henderson, Carol Carpenter she was then, York University was assigned taking Maud here and there, places she'd been, and she was every bit as judgmental and dismissive. Oh, that's just local nonsense. I don't want this. I want the real thing. And she was well up in years then, so she didn't lose that dismissive. Um, we were rather all scared of her, I have to say, although well, we all met her dutifully. You did a superb job. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I mean, I don't... I don't want to present the idea that everything's bad about Maud. I mean, she clearly had those characteristics, oh. but she did all kinds of really valuable work. And as I, I tried to say at the beginning, those early trips with Cecil Sharp, she really was very important to the, to the whole enterprise. So I do think her, her story does need to be told. Yes, uh, if I can send you the Carol, Carol Henderson Carpenter's reference, and also Halpert challenged her in the London meeting, and his words were not mince, and she gave, she sort of forgave him because she was getting an honorary doctorate out of it all. <laughs> thank you for that, Margaret. That's yeah. great to know. So thank you. Uh, well, big thank you to, to Brian. I know how much work goes into uh, these presentations, so thank you so much for that. That was absolutely great. Cheers, thank uh, you. Sorry, Derek, we're going to move on to the, the next speaker, um, who we know very well, somebody else who's presented before, and we all so much enjoyed her, her last talk. So I'm going to hand straight over to Katie, Katie Housen, uh, who's going to continue. She's going to offer us another round uh, of the, the singing in the pubs. Have you got some pictures up yet? We have. Okay, just going to test it. Oh. I've got a problem with that. That won't uh, move on. Oh, it is. Yep, we've moved okay. on now. Yep, sorry. Uh, okay. Sorry, I'm a little bit slow. Uh, I'm still recovering from COVID and I, I thought I was perfectly all right until I tried to do this yesterday and today, but I'm realising my brain is not, <laughs> I'm not firing on all cylinders. Anyway, <clears throat> it's all written down, so I can't forget anything. So, um, OK, off we go then. So um, if you're a regular attendee, a lot of you I know at these Sunday afternoons, you will recall perhaps a talk that I gave a couple of months ago about a BBC radio series on traditional singing broadcast in 1940-41 called Thirsty Work. Quite soon after I gave that talk, I was lucky to get an appointment at the BBC Written Archive Centre in Reading, where I discovered a lot more relevant and fascinating material. I wasn't expecting to get the um, appointment quite so soon, but I, I managed to fit it all into one day and they squeezed me in a, an early appointment. Um, and after that initial talk, um, Steve Rowd had pointed out the significance of this radio series in that we tend to think in Britain that broadcasts of traditional singing in England started with the BBC folk music and dialect recording scheme with Peter Kennedy and Seamus Ennis as the public faces in the early 1950s. But this initiative predates that scheme by a decade. 
I have found some mentions of traditional performers on the radio in the 1930s, but those are isolated instances, and the Thirsty Work series was certainly groundbreaking in its approach of situating the singing in pubs and also in its broad compass of musical styles. There'll be a few echoes in this talk of points uh, that Brian raised, actually. It's quite interesting how they relate to, them, to it. So today is first and foremost an update, a PS to my original talk, um, sketching in some additional information. And in my conclusion, I will also try and place the series into context a little bit. All my research information about the Thirsty Work series is now on my website, unsunghistories.info, which you can see on the bottom of the screen there at the moment. So I'm aware that there are people who uh, didn't come to that talk, so I'm going to give you a quick recap. Um, Thirsty Work was a series of seven radio programmes broadcast between April 1940 to March 1941, conceived and produced by Maurice Brown, BBC radio producer within the Features and Drama Department. It was broadcast on the newly formed Forces programme, intended to boost morale amongst British troops serving overseas, but which was also hugely popular on the home front. I came across this radio series through purely a chance serendipity find in the Radio Times online archive genome. Um, and only a couple of recordings from the programme seem to exist in the British Library and those are not actually identified with this series. This is an ongoing situation. I haven't got any sound clips to play, play to you today, but who knows, there might be a PPS one day with some more sound clips, but uh, we'll see. So my initial research was uh, looking at the people involved, the singers and the people who'd um, arranged the broadcasts and searches on the few songs that we did know about and on other songs that were collected in these locations at different times. As I said before, this update came about after a very fruitful visit to the BBC Written Archives Centre, uh, where there were two programme files, each containing about a hundred items, and these revealed a lot about the two least known locations, information on how the programmes were made, criteria for selecting locations and songs, they revealed the actual songs broadcast in each programme and much, much more. And just as a, a quick introductory word about the recording and broadcasting of the programmes before I tell you a bit more in detail. They were recorded in a BBC mobile broadcasting unit using direct disc cutting technology. Those discs were then edited for use in the broadcasts. Each programme consisted of a very brief studio announcement, followed by the recordings of the songs and chatter and contextual sound effects, with a brief closing announcement, again, live from the studio. At the time, there was no requirement to keep the discs beyond the broadcast date, but luckily the series producer, Maurice Brown, and Marie Slocum, who was later the founder of the BBC Sound Archive, considered it important to archive these recordings, Brown was able to select some of the songs from each programme for library copies to be made. Those library copies from programmes one and two are held in the British Library Sound Archive. And although I've now seen the documentary proof that other discs were sent for processing, for archiving, I haven't yet been able to trace any extant copies. I have got the British Library on the case now, um, uh, so I hopefully I will hear something from them, but I don't hold out a lot of hope for these um, things still existing. You never know. <clears throat> so today I'm going to concentrate on the new information and I'll start by whizzing through the seven locations from which the series was broadcast, spending a bit more time on the two places about which we previously knew very little. And I will concentrate on the songs from those uh, locations rather than the singers themselves. The singers' biographies, including lots of new ones, are all on the website. So programme one in the series was broadcast on the 9th of April 1940 from the Royal Oak in Ambleside in the Lake District. And here, apart from finding the full list of songs broadcast, which predictably enough contained several more hunting songs, the main discovery has been who organised the singers in this location. This was Ernest Skelton, church organist at St Mary's and a music teacher in the town. His family were all very musical and his father organised summer concerts in Ambleside. His brother William was the author of a book, Reminiscences of Joe Bowman and the Ulswater Hounds, published in 1921, which included a song called The Ulswater Pack with music written by Ernest Skelton himself. 
There's no correspondence to show how Ernest Skelson and Maurice Brown came into contact initially, and Brown's first documented visit to the pub was just literally a couple of days before the recording was made, on what he called a see and hear visit. So they were um, doing a recce, as it were, on the on the Thursday, 13th and 14th, and then they recorded on the 15th and the 16th of March. So not a lot of preparatory time. Um, I've now been able to identify the singer of one of the songs we knew about, All Johnny Fellows, as Johnny Bell, who's also revealed as the chairman of the session. And here's a full list of the songs that were recorded that evening. And uh, if you see on the screen, the ones in black are the ones that already knew about in the British Library uh, Sound Archive, which were John Peel, Joe Bowman, sung by Break Black, Sally Gray, sung by Alf Creighton, and All Jolly Fellows, now we know by Johnny Bell. And there were additional five songs there. We'll all go a hunting, New Year's Hunt at Kirk style. Now the horn of the now the horn of the hunter is silent. The old rustic bridge and the farmer's boy. So those six in uh, five in blue at the bottom were in the broadcast, but they were not selected for archiving purposes. Program two was from Redmire in Wensleydale, the King's Arms, in Yorkshire. <coughs> Excuse me, and was broadcast on Saturday the 4th of May. Here the archives have revealed that another BBC producer, Mr Reed, had put Maurice Brown in contact with the landlord at the King's Arms, Joe Alderson, with whom Brown had clearly struck up a warm relationship. Brown made a preparatory recce at the end of March and booked the BBC recording car and technicians for a fortnight later. This trip also necessitated the hire of a car and the acquisition of petrol coupons for Brown and his party to reach what he described as a remote location. Payment instructions in the archive reveal another six singers present at the recording but not listed in the Radio Times. And also one Ralph Fawcett, who wasn't on any lists, but whose letters were contained in the archive files, he wrote to complain, he wrote to Maurice Brown to complain that he had not received any payment, although he'd been invited to be there. Brown was mortified and wrote to Joe Alderson, the landlord, I'm a little worried by two letters from Fawcett, who writes that not only does he think that he has been treated shabbily, but others agree with him in thinking that they were not treated fairly. Could you tell me about this, as I should hate to think so happy an occasion should end in discontent? Neither I nor the BBC have any desire to be mean. <coughs> and we now know the full um, complement of songs that were broadcast on that programme. Uh, the first four we knew about from the British Library um, records. I like to hear the old cock crow, the white cockade, our old Nan's amazer, and on the Ilkley Moor Bar Tat, but also sung that evening, but not selected to be archived, were Wensleydale and Selina, by, sung by Kit Jones, Maggie, sung by Ernest Heseltine, and I Shall Know Him, which is a Sankey and Moody hymn, which the um, group of singers in, in the pub were well known for. And there were two other songs sung that night, but which weren't actually um, broadcast, so I'm not sure if they were even recorded. That was The Rose of Allendale and Rocking the Baby to Sleep. <clears throat> Programme three was from the Eelsfoot East Bridge, and it was broadcast on the 13th of May 1940. And um, the archives had less new information for me on this one, because um, I'd already got the feeling that um, these were recordings that had been made in 1939 for the Saturday Night at the Eels Foot programme and there was in the archives there was confirmation of that fact that no new recordings were made for this um, uh, programme and it was I think put in at sort of short notice as an extra programme really. But the full list of the songs that were broadcast were in the files. Poor Man's Heaven, Tom Goddard, Foggy Dew, Pleasant and Delightful, Duckfoot Sue, The Old Sow and Old Lang Syne, which was a traditional finishing song in this pub and in other ones as well, I know. So a little new information on that one, but the next programme, Programme 4, uh, a lot of new information about this one. This was broadcast from the Exeter's Arms in Wakerley on the 14th of June and um, could find out very little about it initially apart from uh, some of the singers that were listed there. We had no clues about the songs at all. Now I know that it was a BBC man, Charles Laddie Ladbrook, 
sound engineer and studio producer who appears to have made the initial approach to the landlord there. And the chairperson for this broadcast, Percy George White, seems to have been running a pub in Shirebrook in Nottingham, which Nottinghamshire, which had been considered as, as a location for Thirsty Work series, but which was deemed too big and possibly too formal for inclusion. Payment details from the files have made it possible to identify virtually all the singers. And there were some extra ones listed as well. Um, all of these singers were very local, apart from one stranger in town, Frank Smart. I'm not surprised I didn't uh, manage to identify him initially. He lived 50 miles away near Banbury, so what had brought him there that night, um, I've no idea. And so the songs we now know about, no idea at all before uh, the visit to the written archives of, of what was being sung in this pub. And um, there's about nine of ten listed here altogether, including the Frank Smart who'd travelled 50 miles to get there singing Farmer Giles, I Don't Work for a Living, Farmer's Boy, Apple Dumplings, The Ship That Never Returned, Brother Sylvest, uh, and then these ones which were not, um, th those ones were selected for archiving, but as I say, we have not yet turned up any discs with them on. And there were further four songs which um, Brown didn't, uh, wasn't worried about archiving, which were Aby My Boy, one Man Went to Mowing, Banks of the Clyde and The Rose of Tralee. Um, additionally, he'd, he'd done a visit about a week beforehand, his see and hear visit, and had heard some songs that, on that occasion, that he wanted to hear uh, on the broadcast, but they didn't, uh, I don't know what happened, they didn't get sung anyway. Wiring My Lads, uh, The Lincolnshire Poacher from Sam White, who I think actually didn't even, didn't get to the recording, and when first I went to Wagoning. So we're going to move on to two programmes in the Cotswolds now. Uh, programme five was from the Ivy Inn in North Littleton in Worcestershire near Evesham. And um, this location was suggested to Maurice Brown by another BBC producer, Robin Whitworth. We'll come back to him a bit later on. Whitworth worked for the Midlands region and produced many Vox Pop programmes and items of regional interest. And he knew of the other pub in North Littleton, where the landlady was a singer, but he felt this one was preferable. Sorry. When this uh, programme was initially broadcast on the 22nd of July, there was some technical glitch, which meant that only half the programme was heard. Brown was horrified and he wrote to the landlord, Mr Moore, asking him to convey his apologies to all the participants and complained bitterly to the, his BBC managers, demanding that the programme be rebroadcast in full at a later date. So we then found out from the, uh, the programmes as broadcast that only four songs were broadcast in the first instance, which were The Barley Mow, Two Little Girls in Blue, Never Let Your Braces Dangle, and Just Like the Ivy. Uh, there's no clue on these as to who sang what, unfortunately. And on the repeat of the programme, those songs were included, as well as Is Everybody Happy Here, Johnny George, I'm a Broken Down Man, Buttercup Joe, Swim, Sam, Swim and Memories. So, um, although I'm not mentioning any of the singers here, as I say, that's all on the website. Uh, we do know who all the singers were, but we don't know who sang what. Programme six from the Cotswolds followed quite soon afterwards. <clears throat> it was broadcast on the... Um, 20, 28th of November and this was also uh, repeated there was no technical problems but I think they must just have decided by that point that it was worth repeating in these programmes and so it was brought, uh, repeated in January 1941 so by the summer of 1940 it was getting difficult to find pubs where recordings could be made due to the effects of war and the fact that many pubs were being patronised by soldiers from outside the area the local area Correspondence with Charles Gardiner, who you might remember uh, if you heard the, the original talk um, in, in his role as pre-Archer's um, author. Uh, he freelanced for the BBC and had sung in Programme 5 as well. Um, correspondence with him shows that Brown had not originally intended to revisit the Cotswolds so soon, but he was getting short on options, and they agreed that Programme 6 would be recorded in the town of Chipping Camden originally. However, the location then had to be moved at quite short notice to the nearby village of Everington, which involved ferrying some of the Chipping Camden singers out to a quieter pub for the recording. And the songs sung on this occasion 
Uh, none of them are listed, but we do know uh, who sung one or two of these songs here. Down by the Old Abbey Gardens, Foolish Boy, which was definitely Garnet Kite's um, song. Jones as Ale, probably Charles Gardner, he was known for drinking songs. The Fly Beyond the Termit, The Black Horse, which is the Penny Wager um, by George Hawkins that I played a recording to you last time with that one. And Granny's Old Armchair, Robin the Thumb and The Man Who Invented Beer, which is probably Charles Gardner as well, I think. On to the last programme. This was from Harham in North Yorkshire and it was broadcast on the 7th of March 1941. It's the last in the series. And when I presented my findings initially, this programme was probably the most enigmatic. And now it's one of the richest, largely due to some wonderfully detailed correspondence from Brown's contact here. And I can't obviously include a lot of it in the talk today, but there's quite a lot on the website of uh, this man's letters. So a man called Sidney Jameson, who wrote copious notes to Brown, including biographies of the singers, and he suggested the Star Inn as a location. He also made preliminary visits to the pub, offered accommodation to the BBC crew and afterwards sent Brown press cuttings from the local newspaper and his letters are full of descriptive detail. There were a few singers, including Mr Collinson at the inn, he wrote about Harem Star. Mr Collinson sang several grand old songs. He's a star in his class. John Flintoff, farmer, sang songs he'd sung at the inn nearly 50 years ago. Farmer Flintoff and Mr Collinson used to buy penny songbooks or sheets many years ago from old song Harry who used to attend the Martinmas hirings and go around the farms buying horsehair, selling laces and songs. Farmer Flintoff said, they're public house songs ours. We used to buy song sheets off Harry and learn them in the stables and make up our own tunes to them if we didn't know the right ones. Thanks to addresses given in the documentation, I've now identified all the participants as local men. Previously, I'd wondered if some of them were actually soldiers visiting. They were really hard to identify. Uh, but but um, now we've got all those singers and also four more who were mentioned who weren't listed in the Radio Times. So I've got a really good picture of the, uh, the, the singers in that area now. Jameson also considered and described singing sessions in another pub at Norton, probably the Rose and Crown, the Plough Inn at Wombleton and the Buck Inn at Relton. But when he found the Star Inn at Harem, he knew he'd struck gold. And uh, the songs that were sung on this broadcast are listed here. The Doctor's Shop, The Place Where the Old Horse Died, The Little Shirt, Leeds Fair, which is described as a patter song from Tom Oldfield, who's a landlord, The Rover, Bladen Races, and that was from a chap who was from the North East, um, Hull Fisherman, and Polka on Melodian by Robert Ford. So this is that's the first, the only um, instrumental item in any of these programmes that's listed as, as such. And Sidney Jameson also mentioned another song, Some People Think It's Jolly to Lead a Single Life, sung by Reg Marsden. So I'm now going to look at some broader issues, <clears throat> starting with the criteria used for selecting songs and pubs. When I first came across these programmes in the Radio Times, I soon noticed that the words folk and traditional were never used in the descriptions. It was usually something like an evening of country and popular songs. Correspondence in the archives has revealed the principle behind this vocabulary. For example, in February 1940, just as the new programme for the forces was being rolled out, Maurice Brown had written to Lawrence Gilliam, the head of BBC Features and Drama, explaining his vision for this series. I know that the idea of recorded programmes of pub singing is an old hobby horse of mine, but I feel six or more 15 minute broadcasts could be made of this material for the British Expeditionary Forces programme. This would not be in any way confined to folk songs, but would consist of songs they sing in given large areas. For instance, in the Lakeland pubs there are fell songs and hunting songs, in Yorkshire their own dialect songs, in Kent hopping songs, etc, etc. And everywhere you find songs the troops know. It's merely a matter of editing to produce a short programme, which although in part localised should still be popular both to the man who comes from that part of the country and the mass who enjoys singing songs. It's interesting, actually, that he um, pitched it as 15 minute programmes because throughout the correspondence, you can see him fighting to, for another five minutes for his next programme and another five minutes for his next programme. Brown also stated his criteria to any potential landlord or host for these programmes. In April 1940, for example, 
a Mr J.B. Landon wrote from the Golden Lion in Islington, suggesting that his pub might be suitable. He regularly held singing competitions there to audiences of 150 or so people, and he wrote that he'd read about the forthcoming programmes in the evening news. Brown responded, In the pub broadcast which I'm producing, I do not use many singers. What I want is from 10 to 20 people singing because they like it. They also must sing songs representing their own district or county. If you could find some completely non-professional singers who will sing Cockney and London solos and choruses, I shall be very pleased to come and hear them when I'm next in London. He was based in Manchester at the time. So um, other locations for consideration <coughs> and future developments of the series now. Maurice Brown's contacts amongst his BBC colleagues in the regions are indicated in a number of internal, internal memos. And Robin Whitworth, mentioned before, who's based in Birmingham, was particularly significant. And their correspondence between the two of them reveals that some specific locations that were under consideration. One they seemed keen on was Mausel in Cornwall. And a perusal of the radio schedules shows that the Mausel male voice choir, pictured here in 1939, uh, was already well known and was on the radio at least once a year from 1933 to 1966. Other potential locations included a place called Hillersley near Stroud in Gloucestershire, where the Portcullis Inn pictured here was another of these picturesque thatched buildings. Uh, but there were also several more urban settings being considered. In the West Midlands, Willen Hall, Newcastle under Lyme, Wolverhampton and the Stork Inn at Great Bridge near West Bromwich pictured here. These might well have been under consideration for a second series. At the end of 1940, plans were being laid for another series of Thirsty Work, this time to consist of 12 half-hour programmes. However, given the problems with pubs during wartime, a change of perspective was suggested by, Lawrence, uh, by Brown's boss, Lawrence Gilliam, to whom Brown wrote on the 22nd of October 1940, I've been making inquiries about your suggested series of programmes on Thirsty Work lines. It seems likely that we could broadcast these, certainly fortnightly and perhaps weekly. I contemplate including broadcasts from Polish, Czech, Belgian, French and Dutch camps, the American Eagle Squadron, in addition to army messes, aerodromes and between decks on board naval ships. And on the 7th of November, Gilliam responded, I've discussed the new series for Thirsty Work with Mr Langham and he welcomed the idea for 30 minute programmes on the new plan starting in the new year. But it seems that events overtook this proposal and the Radio Times archive shows only occasional programmes produced by Brown from 1941 until the end of the war. He became a sub-lieutenant in the Naval Reserve and several of the programmes he produced were recorded on board naval ships, but there's little mention of singing. So I'm now going to just look at what uh, at folk music on the BBC in the years following the Thirsty Work series and trace Maurice Brown through these as well. So for a few years, traditional singing seemed to get scant attention on the BBC, with the exception probably of a country magazine programme. This was a programme that ran from 1942 to 1954. Although it featured a traditional song in the middle of each programme, with Francis Collinson as the musical arranger, this programme only rarely included traditional singers. In fact, according to the producer Francis Dillon, when we'd run about two years, a lady wrote to AJ Street, that was the programme's original presenter, saying... Can't you put a stop, stop to those awful songs? It wasn't Maud Carpley's, was it? I seem to be coming out in the same voice, Brian. <laughs> Can't you put a stop to those awful songs? Doesn't the producer know that countrymen don't sing? Uh, in the pictures here, you can see Francis Collinson collecting from a country singer, uh, from C.W. Lucas, from Sixpenny Handley in Dorset. Uh, this programme also had a short-lived spin-off in 1952 called The Postman Brings Me Songs which was presented by Francis Collinson and produced by Maurice Brown. Then in 1947, the earliest seeds were sown for what would eventually become the BBC Folk Music and Dialect Recording Scheme, when Brian George, a Donegal man from the BBC Recorded Programmes Department, arranged an exploratory trip to Ireland to meet Seamus Ennis and make field recordings there. It seems probable probable that Morris Brown was involved as a recording made in Kerry in August 1947 is credited to him on volume one of Alan Lomax's World Library of Primitive and Folk Music LP series. 
Brian George and Marie Slocum, who was by then the official sound archive archivist at the BBC, then went on to become the leading lights in the creation and management of the aforementioned recording scheme, which employed, amongst others, Seamus Ennis and Peter Kennedy to actively collect folk song from a pilot in 1949 through to 1957. And just a little aside here, the Irish connection. The pictures here show Seamus Ennis at the top recording on the shore of Loch Clunachlin in Kerry in 1947. And that's just a kind of um, system that I think, uh, well, I don't know exactly the same, probably moved on slightly in technology, but you can see a direct disc cutting machine in the back of a car there. Uh, and the other picture at the bottom there shows uh, BBC's 1949 trip to the Aran Islands and includes Morris Brown's colleague Charles Laddie Ladbrook on the right. Slocum and George, of course, created the legendary BBC radio series As I Rove Doubt, which ran from 1953 to 1958 and included many recordings made under the scheme, albeit mostly as short snippets. The scheme collectors often worked from existing leads and Peter Kennedy on the left here, along with the other presenters from the As I Rove Doubt, visited at least two of the Thirsty Work program, uh, locations, Redmire and Ebrington, on the trail of Morris Brown's singers. He also tried to meet up with Charles Gardner and Evesham, but it doesn't seem as if he got to Wakerley or Harren, the least known of the Thirsty Work locations. Now, interested though Morris Brown was in folk song, I think he held somewhat different views to the folk music establishment about both style and substance. And in Thirsty Work, he deliberately chose to include material which would have been rejected by the folk music and dialect recording scheme. The Thirsty Work programmes were presented in the raw, songs as sung in the pub, without any accompaniment on most occasions, and with no commentary. The announcer's scripts are in the BBC Written Archive Centre and consist of a minimal introduction and outgoing announcement. In between were just the songs and general sound effects of the sonic environment. In contrast, as I roved out, was much more heavily mediated by folk song collecting principles and also broadcast only snippets of songs interspersed by orchestral arrangements of the melodies played by trained musicians. In August 1941, in a letter to the listener, Brown wrote in response to a feature about Cecil Sharp in a programme entitled Everybody's Scrapbook. Whilst acknowledging Sharp's magnificent work, he argued against Sharp's daughter, who in the programme had talked about folk song singing as something that was dead and gone, and claimed, if my father had started any later, there would have been little to collect. Brown, referring specifically to the Thirsty Work series, commented, The singing itself is very varied, but there are still singers of great style, with all the swagger, decoration and rhythmic changes of real folk song delivery. Which is a lovely little quote to finish this on, I think, and I'd just like to say thank you to Sue Allen and John Baxter for supplying some of those quotes and information for me. And thanks as ever to the TSF for for facilitating this gathering and sharing of thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Katie. That's obviously been a really rich scene, hasn't it, of uh, information and background and uh, important things about what went on in those times. So thank you so much for, for doing that work and presenting that to us. Um, we're just about over time. If there was one question, if it was quick, I might allow it. Um, <laughs> I don't see one coming at the moment. Sue oh, Sue, Sue. Right, this is your chance. <laughs> I see. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. I don't know whether you've looked into any regional broadcasts. I know, and I am researching some that were done in the north, but do you know if there were other regional broadcasts of folk music done in the regional opt-out programmes that there were from the home service? Yes, yes, there were some, yes. Yes, oh, right. yes they, 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 then it's quite hard to find the earlier ones because, you know, what, what terminology are you looking for? And there are all sorts of odd bits yeah. of programmes, like the... Um, the one that uh, was done in 1947 that was quite well known, East Anglia Sings, which was Eels Foot and the Windmill in Sutton. There was also a programme called Northumbria Sings, 
um, and there may well have been some other ones, but trying to find those is quite difficult. Mm -hmm. And as you say, some of, some of them are broadcast on the regional services, and in, if you're looking in the Radio Times, there's a, just a tiny, tiny mention of them. But mm -hmm. they, do, they do get picked up. If you, if you search through the Genome Archive, it picks up all the regional and national That's ones. good to know. Thank you. Yeah. Great presentation. It's wonderful. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Katie. That was a lovely presentation. And uh, I'm sorry, we never got to hear Never Let Your Braces Dangle <laughs> by the consequences of that. But <laughs> maybe somebody already knows it and they can let us know. <laughs> so thanks so much, Katie. That was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to move on to our last speaker, and this is Meg, Meg Highland, uh, who I'm pretty sure is speaking to us for the first time. It is, isn't it? Yep. Um, so welcome particularly to Meg. And she's going to be talking to us about the herring gutters and fishers and the songs that they, sorry, it's not fishers, it's herring gutters and packers, isn't it? Um, and, and the songs that they sang, which uh, I'm absolutely sure it's going to be a huge contrast to what was sung in in the pubs in the 1940s. So Meg, are you there? Yes, hi. Um, oh, thanks wonderful. for the introduction. Um, <laughs> let me just share my screen. Um, can you guys see the PowerPoint? Yes. Yes, we can. Excellent. Okay. Um, so thanks for the introduction. Those first two talks were really interesting to listen to. Um, I'm really, this is my first time being here um, and I've really enjoyed it. I'm hoping to come to more. Um, there might be a few people in the audience who have heard me talk about this before. Um, Margaret Bennett has, in fact, she's helped me with this project in the past. Um, so it's nice to see you there, Margaret. Um, Cause I did give a talk about this um, at the University of Edinburgh Celtic Studies Seminar um last year but since then i've done some field work in shetland um last summer uh and so there will be some uh, new material even if you have heard some of this before um for others it might be completely new um so i'm a phd student at edinburgh and this is um what my research is about um music and dance in the lives of the women and sometimes men um, who worked as itinerant herring gutters and packers in the british and irish fishing industries um, so my talk is called, Sometimes I Think We Sang to Stop Ourselves from Crying, Singing at Work Among Herring Gutters and Packers. Oop, there we go. Okay, so if you're not familiar with the herring industry, just a really brief overview. Um, from the commercial, I mean, herring has obviously been fished here since the Middle Ages and earlier. Um, but what we're looking at is the kind of industrial herring industry, um, which started in the um, lowlands of Scotland in particular in the early to mid 19th century, and then spread um, to take in other parts of the country like the Hebrides, um, East Anglia, and Northern Ireland, um, and the Isle of Man. So you can see this map um, it's actually a map of herring stocks, but it gives you kind of a rough idea of the area we're talking about. Um, but what happened was the boats would start um, around May um, around the Hebrides, and then they would move around the coast. Um, so up to Shetland, then down to like Fraser Head, uh, Fra not Fraser Head, Fraser Burra and Peterhead. Um, <laughs> and then down the Fife coast, and then finally to East Anglia. Um, and the East Anglian fishing would tend to end by the end of November. So for several months, there were women who would be employed by the curers. The curers are the one who cure the herring. Um, so packing it into barrels and salting it for export, mainly to Germany and the Baltic countries and Russia. Um, and so you would have women, they would travel from port to port so they'd be ready when the boats landed the fish because herring spoils very quickly. Um, so in order to pack it for export, it has to be packed pretty much immediately. And so the women would travel on boats and trains um, across the country um, in order to be ready to meet the herring when it came. So that's the context of this industry. Um, the crews tended to be um, two gutters and one packer. Um, you can see in the picture in the background here, which is from the Scottish Fisheries Museum, um, there's like this long trough that the fish gets dumped into that's called the farlin. And um, so the women would stand bent over the farlin and they could gut up to one fish a second, which is pretty remarkable. Um, it was very fast and skilled work. Um, women tended to start around the age of 14 when they left school. 
Oftentimes they would just work until they got married, but in some cases women would go back to the work, um, maybe if they'd been widowed or um, once their children were grown. Um, when some even kept working when they had children and would bring their children with them in their travels. Um, but for the most part, they were quite young women, teenagers and women in their early 20s. Um, so that's the group we're looking at. And um, the herring stock crashed in the mid 20th century. Um, in the late 1960s, um, mechanization was introduced to the gutting project, which I'll come back to at the end of the presentation. Um, but for most of what we're talking about, we're talking about the hand gutting, um, which went on for about 100 years. Um, and at the height, you know, there would be thousands of women gutting in a pour at a time. So I have a couple quotes here because um, the fact that the women sang while gutting is not always that well known. Um, so I have several different quotes here. Um, First one I wanted to point out is um, from the School of Scottish Studies Archives. Um, a Christina McKinnon of the Isle of Barra described gutting songs as oran lui nakutuh, which it means the walking songs of the gutting. And that's really interesting because it shows you that, you know, there's a really rich Gaelic work song tradition that these women would have already had before they started working in the commercial fishing industry. Um, and that's like, you know, walking the twee, they would sing um, all sorts of milking songs, um, uh, all sorts of different work, lullabies, all of that would be accompanied with music. And um, you can see that by calling them Oran Lui Nakutuh, they're situating the gutting songs into this tradition of work song that they already have. Um, then you get some uh, observations from outsiders um, so, for example, um, Frances Wilkins at the University of Aberdeen um, looked at gutting song a little bit when she was doing her research on sacred singing in the northeast of Scotland. Um, and she has an interview with a guy here who says they would get, they got into a rhythm, you see? It would have been pum, pum, pum with a rhythm, something with a rhythm. You'd hear the singing all around the fish yards. And his emphasis on the rhythm is interesting because with work song, one of the big features of it is often highlighted as the, the singing helped the rhythm of the work. And that's certainly the case with the walking to the point where it was very rare to do a walking without singing. Um, and the gutting is not quite like that. You would sometimes have gutters who would not sing while they were working, but this stuff about the rhythm and connecting it to the Oran Lue suggests that there was an element of rhythmic coordination there. Um, presumably to help um, get into the zone and to lessen injuries. The women would tie their fingers um, with pieces of cloth called cluties in Scots um, to try to prevent, because of course the fish was salted. So if you cut yourself, it was very painful. Um, there's a book about the herring gutters in Gaelic, um, which quotes an unnamed English gutter. Um, who says, as you pass through Lower Pulteney and Wick, you could hear them singing the lovely Gaelic songs as they worked at the herring. Um, but it wasn't just Gaelic songs. Um, for example, a Scots speaker named Jeannie Gay says here, in the dark, the lights went up and that was when we started to sing. Um, so it wasn't limited to the Gaelic speakers at all. Um, you have a account here from 1893 um, when they said that the women would sing cheerfully as they worked in the rain. Um, and the writer says, we found out afterwards that singing over their work was a sure sign that it was hard and that they were tired as they would then sing to keep up their spirits. And that's a very interesting point because as I'm sure many of you know, there can be a real stereotype of the happy singing worker in the sense of, oh, um, they're singing so their working conditions can't be bad, right? But it's actually often quite the opposite, this sense of singing to keep them going. Um, and that's reflected in this quote from um, Marabella Finley of White Hills, which I used in the title, we sang a lot at work. I sometimes think we sang to stop ourselves crying um, because the women had very difficult working conditions. Um, they would often be up at five or six in the morning um, and working with the barrels um, they had packed yesterday, they had to top them up. And then when the fish came in, it was sort of, you know, you had to keep working until the fish were done being salted. So if they had caught, if there was a big catch, you could be working until midnight or one in the morning. Um, maybe not every day if the catch was bad, but on the other hand, you wanted there to be a good catch because they were paid piecemeal. So the more barrels they filled, the more they got paid. 
Um, and then the final quote here is from a woman I spoke to um, in Shetland who's in her 90s, Sissy Goodlad. Um, and she said, we would all sing the same one together, same song. It couldn't have happened very often, but sometimes we did if we were feeling happy. Um, so that also shows that it's not just to power yourself through difficult things. It's also sometimes they genuinely did feel happy um, doing the work. And that's something that comes out a lot when you read their personal narratives, because you know, they were mostly young women. They were away from parental supervision for the first time. You know, if you came from a little um, village, say in the Hebrides, you may never have left the island before. Um, and so it was very an exciting time meeting people, um, meeting the fishermen, which as you'll see was a frequent theme in their songs. Um, oops, let's see. Okay, so first I'll talk a little bit more about the Gallic gutting songs. Um, these are the oldest examples of gutting songs that I've found so far. Um, Nan McKinnon um, from Vattersay was one of the great contributors to the School of Scottish Studies archive. And her mother had been a herring gutter in the 1880s. Um, and there are a few songs that Nan provided for the School of Scottish Studies collectors in the 50s. Um, which she said her mother learned from Lewis girls at the gutting. Um, and so that's the 1880s, those are the oldest I've been able to attach a provenance um, to a gutting song. And even though they describe them sometimes by comparing them to walking songs, um, like saying, what they actually sang tended to be por stabil, which is mouth music used for dancing. And I think there's a few reasons for this. Porsche de Beale is much faster than most walking songs. Um, there are some walking songs that have a fast pace. Those are called the clapping songs for the end of the process. Um, but Porsche de Beale is very fast um, sung for dancing. And so I think at the, you know, they were, if they were gutting one fish a second, a fast dance song would have probably suited the pace of what they were doing more. And the other reason that I think they sang Porsche de Beale was because on the weekends, they would hold dances in their huts, their temporary accommodations, particularly in Shetland, where they were provided um, separate accommodations. In some other places like Yarmouth, they would be put up as lodgers, um, so they weren't at liberty to host dances <laughs> in the same way. Um, but so they, they, it is also reported that they would sing Porsche de Beale to accompany their own dancing on the weekends. And I think there was a, probably a lot of overlap between these songs they were singing at the weekends and the ones they were singing while working, um, because a lot of them were quite improvised. So you would have these kind of love song formulas, um, but then they would be inserting the names of different fishermen and different place names, often from Lewis. There's quite a strong Lewis representation in this tradition. And they would often be quite body and fast paced, maybe more similar to pub songs um, than one might have guessed. Um, and they also have a lot of information in them about the women's economic aspirations. So for example, um, I don't have time to go into this part in too much detail in this talk, but one thing they often sang about was how they wanted white washed houses, like the ones they saw in the places they had traveled to um, like Shetland, for the gutting, um, saying things like, I don't want a thatched house anymore. You know, when I try to meet up with my boyfriend in a thatched house, somebody always walks in on us. Um, I want a house with like separate rooms and a staircase and a wooden floor. And my fisherman lover, he's gonna build that for me when we go back home. Um, so that's really interesting um, because I think it shows that these women were drivers of housing change in the Hebrides, um, you know, the decline of the black house. Um, because they, I'm not saying this is true about black houses. I'm sure they have lots of good qualities too, but the women in these songs are singing about them as kind of dirty places with a lack of privacy. Um, and so that shows that, you know, they're really paying attention to the different architectural styles as they travel around Scotland and England, and they want to bring some of that back home. And then the final really interesting point about the Gallic gutting songs is that they show real influence from English and Scots music. Um, in a minute, I'm going to play you an example of a gutting song, and you might notice that the, um, depending on how familiar you are with Gaelic song, um, the refrains are a little bit more like diddling than you often get in Scottish Gaelic refrains. You know, when you think of a walking song refrain, it's often like, ho ho hi ho that's sort of like, 
a lot of ho and he and that sort of thing. Um, whereas the gutting refrains are often diddled. And there's an interesting quote um, from that same woman, the title quote was from Mary Bella Finley. She worked in Shetland in 1930 and alongside some Gallic speaking women. And she said, um, pretty soon they had us singing in their own language. And I think that's really interesting because presumably, you know, there's no indication she actually learned to speak Gallic. So I think what was probably happening was that the women who didn't speak Gallic were joining in on the Gallic refrains and they may have brought some of their own vocalizing techniques to that. Um, and there's a lot of Scots and English words, um, which you'll also see in the example I'm about to play. So um, you can definitely see that these women were very happy to participate in the linguistic environment around them while also composing new songs in Gaelic. Um, the English and Scots wasn't a threat from their perspective um, to their language. So I'm just gonna play um, this bit, oh, it's already here, from Mary Morrison. Um, and you can follow along the lyrics. Morg McLeod printed this in Tocher um, a while back. So she, is the one who's translated this. So that gives you a sense of, um, it's hard not to kind of bounce along when you're hearing that. Mary Morrison, um, pictured here from Barra, she was renowned um, for the, of course, she would sing at dances. They said it was really hard not to dance when you would listen to her sing. And so this is a song, um, I, we don't have time to listen to the whole thing, but you can see um, Warren McLeod's italicized here on the left um, when the English words have come in like, it's an engine room, a um, my love is in the engine room. <laughs> and then the names of the boats, um, honeydew and fair weather. I did some research in the fisheries museum um, and those boats first came um, into service in the industry um, by 1922. Um, so that's probably around the time that Mary Morrison would have improvised these lyrics because this song is a formula that already existed um, about the, the strait between, um, I think it's Bernera and Ewick or something. Uh, and, but she's clearly improvised some lyrics, which I'm told are pretty dirty in Gaelic. I don't have time to get into explaining all the innuendos. Um, but uh, so that's an example of the Gaelic gutting songs. So there were also a lot of women in the industry who spoke Scots and English as their native languages. Um, one uh, person I interviewed, it was actually, I gave a talk in Anstruther about this when I first started looking into it years ago. And um, he started singing this song after the talk and said he hadn't thought of it, but his mother sang it when he was a kid. So. I went and interviewed him. Uh, his name is Bill Motion. He's actually a trustee of the Scottish Fisheries Museum. And the little paragraph you see here, um, did you see the KYs coming? He sang that and his mother sang that um, to the tune of Bon Accord, the Scottish dance song. And KY is the registration number for boats um, in the East Nuke of Fife um, because that stands for Kirkcaldy. Um, and so it's about the local boats. And then he says, did you see the KYs coming with Bonnie Jockey Murray on their boo? And he says, Jockey Murray was their neighbor at the time his mother sang this to him. And she said, yeah, I sang this to my pal to tease her because she was dating Jockey Murray at the time. And then it, it turns out she, the woman and Jockey Murray got married and were their neighbors by the time Bill Motion heard his mother singing this years later. So you know, it's pretty rare to have that level of detail about the composition of these songs, but you can imagine that all the Gallic ones that are throwing in random names like Mudahug and Eon, it's like those would have been just as personal originally, but they've just been kind of crystallized without their context. Um, so these would have been very fluid. And then um, the interviews in Shetland, um, I went through a lot of interviews that had been done in the, that were in the Shetland archive. Um, and the women there really commented that the Scottish women, usually they, they would call them Scotch, which is a bit of a faux pas, but I guess that's what they said in Shetland. <laughs> and um, 
they would sing traditional Scottish songs and music hall. Um, I'll get back to the music hall in a minute, but um, this is an example, um, Zeta Sinclair. Um, okay, no, it's sorry, it's Isla Sinclair. It says her grandmother, Madge McDonald from the Isle of Lewis sang this song while standing on the quay at Stornoway waiting for the boats to return home. Oh, the fisherman's a bonny, bonny lad. I've never seen anything bolder. He wears his sea beats over his knees and the straps across his shoulders. I'm a rambling, tumbling, father do a day. I'm a rambling, tumbling, lassie. I'm a rambling, tumbling, father do a day. So you can see that's again an example of where they're singing about um, their own experiences and this um, that wasn't sung um, she, in the context she shares about her grandmother that wasn't sung while working but there's an interview with her mother Zeta Sinclair um, who does talk about singing she said we would sing that song while we were gutting but they sang it much faster when they were actually working. Um, and so there is a lot of overlap in, you know, it can be hard to say, oh, this one was just sung while working. This one wasn't, it, it wasn't really like that. Um, and then the final one um, from this slide I'd like to play is an example of a woman who sang um, a music hall song. Um, so this woman was from Wick. I'm just gonna try to skip ahead a little cause she introduces it. Um, and she, uh, yeah, so this is an example of a music hall song. Oh, I'm 94 this morning, I am 94 today. I'm not as young as I used to be, I'm getting old and grey. But my heart is young and I'm fond of fun and I'm very proud to see. I maybe get married on Thursday, so I'm 94 today. So that's, um, she says, it's, she says in the interview, it's funny, you know, when they were singing that they were like 20 and they could never imagine being 94. But in that recording, she was in her late eighties. Um, so, and the picture in the background here is just women on their way to work, um, which is another time when they were said to sing very often. So another category um, was hymns. Some women would sing hymns while they were working. And like I said, Frances Wilkins at Aberdeen has done research on this. Um, she interviewed people um, who told her about how they would sing Hymns that often had nautical themes. So um, the I will make you fishers of men, deep and wide throughout the lifeline. Um, another one, which I don't know if they sang while working, but was extremely popular was Will Your Anchor Hold? Um, so you can see it's like they're pre-existing songs, but they're picking ones that are really relevant to their life. And this was because um, there were the fishing communities in the Northeast in particular in the 1890s and then again in um, 1921. Um, they were really bad years for the fishing that coincided with um, evangelical revivals. And so you would have people just like singing on the streets. Um, the fishermen would sing, they would sing certain hymns as they left the harbor. And then depending on how good the catch was would affect which hymn they sang when they came back. So really complex um, interaction with the hymn. Um, and they really liked um, the Moody and Sankey hymns in particular. Um, and so here's, you see in this quote from Yarmouth in 1921, some girls sang as they toiled favorite Scotch songs, but in one yard they blended their voices and hymns. So that shows you how, um, you know, it wasn't as if the whole yard was singing the same song. You'd have groups of women at different farlands, and usually you'd have one leading singing the verses and the others would join in on the refrain. Sometimes um, the hymn singing was from a deep evangelical belief other times, um, as Jeannie Innes from Bucky said here, um, they kent all the hymns, they didn't ken so many, or so mickle other songs. Sorry for my Scots. But, um, so, you know, they would just kind of sing what they knew. So sometimes that was just hymns. Um, but then uh, one of the women I spoke to in Shetland, Adeline Fullerton, um, she worked at the gutting in the late 60s and early 70s when the machines had come in. And she said um, they did not sing hymns. She said, we escaped church. So um, by the end of the gutting period, they had fallen out of fashion. Um, and then um, just tell me if I need to stop, but I have um, just a few other things I wanted to mention. Um, so the Irish element is something that I'm doing some research on. When I was doing the interviews in Shetland, um, both the people I interviewed myself 
and the archival interviews I read, there was a lot of mention of the Irish workers. And in Scotland, it was very unusual for men to work in the gutting. I've only come across one um, reference to a man who worked as a gutter. Men usually worked as coopers who made the barrels or as fishermen. But itinerant workers from Ireland would come over and there were often as almost as many men as there were women coming to do the gutting. There doesn't um, seem to have been the same stigma against men doing this work um, among the Irish. And so you get Shetlanders talking about um, like this one woman saying the Irish boys liked the tune, the boys of Blue Hill. Um, they were just really a lot on the dancing and sometimes a little bit of competition and conflict with the Scottish fishermen um, who wouldn't, they didn't want to let the Irish boys in or the Irish boys would dance with the Scottish girls before the men had come back and there might have been a little bit of a fracas then when the fishermen showed up at the dance. Um, and then um, an interesting comment from Adeline Fullerton, um, again, this was, would have been in the late 60s, she said that the men would sing um, Irish rebel songs um, which she thought was politically a little risky. Um, although she said they she, they wouldn't allow um, Danny Boy in her hut um, because of some superstition associated with um, her family. Um, and so she said if they started singing Danny Boy, she'd just say, get out! Um, so there was a lot of um, teasing and interplay there. Um, and then Rita McNabb was a woman I spoke to in Shetland. She worked before the gutting machines. So she started gutting, I think, around 1950. And she said they would sing a lot of Irish songs um, like the old rugged cross and Danny boy. And you sometimes, uh, one of the women, um, I can't remember which one I didn't put on the slide, but so, uh, she was too young to go um, to the dances because she didn't have a boyfriend yet. Um, when her friends who are a few years older would go to the dances in the huts. So she would go over to the Irish women's huts and just sit and have tea with them and they would be singing and playing the fiddle. Um, so that's something I'd like to look into more, the kind of song exchange between the Irish and Scottish workers. And then the last category of music um, is, country. it's a big category, country, Western and pop. Um, so in Shetland, by the 1940s and 50s, American country and Western music had become extremely popular. And so um, Sissy Goodlad, one of the women I spoke to, told me that they loved um, Hank Williams and Jimmy Rogers. And one of the songs she remembered singing while gutting was Mockingbird Hill. Um, and so I think this is interesting, kind of like um, what Brian was talking about, the bleeding between radio music and folk music. You really see that in this later period, even in the earlier period with the music hall. Um, you know, to them, they weren't worried about the, those distinctions. And even to the point where Rita McNabb told me that she would sing um, Ewan McCall's Shoals of Herring, which is a folk revival song, um, while she was filling up the barrels. Um, and she also talked about how they would listen to Nat King Cole and the Ink Spots. Um, Adeline Fullerton had a very vivid memory of some Norwegian fishermen stopping by in 1968 and being obsessed with the record Baby Come Back. Um, and they would listen to the Beatles, Rolling Stones, Herman Hermits. But um, by the time of the machines, they were no longer singing that while they were working because it was too loud to sing over the machines. So that's more what they would listen to in their huts. Um, and I've got a picture um, from the Fisheries Museum. This is a prototype of a gutting machine. So I think the actual ones might have been bigger. Um, but this is a prototype that they have at the museum. Um, and you can see um, there's a real sense of loss um, from the perspective of people who witnessed the transition um, to the gutting machines, which then only lasted a few years. Um, a Cooper in Shetland said the machine was harder. Whereas when you're outside on a lovely day, the farlands are full of herring, the birds singing, and usually the lasses, a lot of them was singing too. Whereas Adeline Fullerton described the machines as very noisy. Um, one woman I spoke to who asked for her name not to be given um, said, you can maybe whistle over the machine, but you really couldn't sing. Um, because it was just too loud. And Rita McNabb said, um, when the machine comes in, this was going to be the best thing since sliced bread, but I couldn't see it. And I still can't see it because it finished it. The machine never stopped for a cup of tea or nothing. There was more work to it than just saying, oh, it's quicker. But I always said, quicker for who? 
Um, so Rita was very negative about the machine. And although the women who had only worked on the machine didn't have the same level of anger towards it, they also reported that um, because of the machine setup, they were no longer singing communally while working, but they did continue singing in their huts together. So the conclusions, um, this is ongoing research and those Shetland bits are fresh from my field work last year. Um, it was a multilingual musical, social and working environment. Um, you had a, quite a lot of similarities in topic across linguistic boundaries. You know, love songs were absolutely the most popular. Um, the only real exception was that the Gallic women did not sing religious music while they gutted, even though they often came from extremely religious islands, um, such as Lewis there was really a sense that that was not the place to be singing sacred music, whereas for the evangelical Scotch, Scots women, it was sort of like, you have to glorify God in everything you do. Um, so they thought it was appropriate. And what you really see in this range of genres across the century is the young women would just sing whatever songs were popular at the time. That might be what we consider traditional folk music, or it might be like Herman's Hermits <laughs> and pretty much everything in between. Um, and the gutting machine led to the end of singing while working, but singing and dancing in the huts persisted, um, which shows just how strong an association there was between music and the time you worked at the gutting. Um, so that's the end of the presentation. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'll just um, stop sharing my screen there. Great. so much Meg. Really, she has a feeling in your voice. Really um, just opened up a whole area that I certainly knew nothing about and uh, did it clearly and beautifully so thank you and good luck with the rest of your research. It's, uh, thank you. it's going to be good so thank <laughs> you so much. We have time for the one question that John Baxter would like to ask you so uh, John Oh, well, I'm sorry to be the only person asking a question. It was just to say that was I really enjoyed that. And I wondered if you thought of making comparisons with work songs aboard ship. It seems to be um, that you've got a community of women from very different backgrounds brought together and bringing singing traditions together. And that's what happened aboard, aboard ship. And aboard ship, all sorts of songs became shanties, including you know, popular songs from various, well, from the musical and elsewhere. So mm -hmm. I just, I just thought it was a, a really fascinating talk, and I just wondered if you'd made that comparison with the, with the, the workplace aboard ship. Yeah, thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, that's definitely something I've been thinking about because, especially right when I started doing my research, was when the kind of sea shanty craze hit the internet, um, and so people were always asking me about it. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of similarities. Like you said, it's a mostly kind of single gender working community um, in a nautical industry. Um, the main, and there are some similarities that I think people have underplayed. Um, so for example, the women sang body songs as well, which the men were very well known for. Um, the main differences I've noticed is that um, from what I've read, there seem to be some taboos around singing shanty work songs um, on shore. Um, which was more for the folksal or forecastle songs. Um, I, I have to do some more reading about how real that distinction really was, um, but that seems to not have been the case at all for the gutters. They're, they don't seem to have made that sort of distinction. So I'm, I'm not sure if um, there was a, it just seems like the, the shanty had maybe more specific uses, um, whereas the gutters had a more, lowercase c Catholic approach to the whole thing. That was really a good question. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. And before Katie asks her question, I would just say that somebody in the chat has asked if you would put your email. On. Oh, yeah. I would love for people to message me. Please send me emails. I don't always respond right away because I'm migraines, but um, I, I love getting the emails. So I put my email in the chat there. Right. Thank you. And now, Katie, if you'd like to ask your question. Yeah, hi. Um, I live in uh, East Anglia, and I know a bit about the, um, you know, the, the the herring fishing from from 
the aspect down here and we collected some songs from a man actually who wasn't involved in the fishing but one of those songs was called the shoals of herring and it was not the Ian McCall song and I'm just wondering if you're um, woman who mentioned the shoals of herring actually specified that it was that song or whether it might possibly have been the song that we collected in Suffolk. Well now I'm really interested to hear that song but um, I like, did clarify with her I was like read it like is it this one and I started singing like oh it was so far and then and she's like yeah 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 that's the one oh, okay. so okay. in that case I was it actually was but um, that's very interesting now oh Margaret's putting interesting things in the chat I'll have to read later <laughs> but um <laughs> but that was um now, yeah, you, you should email me about that. I will do. I, I will do. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful. I love all this cross fertilization that's going on all over the place. That's absolutely great. That was a wonderful talk. Thank you, Meg. Uh, thank you again for all the, the work that's gone into that. Thank you to our two other speakers who oh, it's been a really fascinating afternoon. Thank you, Katie, for uh, more of your work. And uh, and of course, to, to Brian, that was uh, well, all of it was brilliant. So lovely to see you all. Please don't forget, we'll be on the 20th of March again. We'll look forward to seeing you then. Um, and any news items, please do send them to Martin. He'd be uh, more than happy to uh, find more to say in in the next newsletter so that's great right i'm just going to ask have i forgotten anything don't think so no don't think so <laughs> right, okay. thank you sean well you're very welcome um that was a wonderful afternoon thank you so much to everybody great to see you all and we'll see you again soon